Hey, everybody. I'm Artie. Welcome to a special episode, very special episode of Age of Quarantine, uh, the St. Vitus Bar chat show. Um, today, uh, we have one of the biggest, the singer of one of the biggest bands in the world. Um, and uh, I hope everybody's excited to hear from uh, one of my favorites, uh, a hero, shall we say, a guy who um, I watched uh, very close up early on and uh, really changed my perspective on a lot of things musically. Um, uh, his name is Simon Neal, and the band is Biffy Clyro. And uh, I just found out my Blue Apron just got delivered. That's great. Um, and uh, I hope uh, hope he joins us soon. Uh, we're very excited to have him and. Uh, I want to thank his management here in America for letting this happen. Um, and uh, we're getting a lot of people on here. Oh, shit. Alex Haber, how you doing, buddy? I um, uh, wish Ben and James could be on this as well, because those guys uh, have a lot to say. They're very funny fellas. Um, and uh, I toured with these guys in uh, 2003, I guess it was. And uh, it was really a fantastic time. And Simon is here. But let's see if we can... So I can shut the fuck up and you can talk to somebody I won't understand. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, oh, hey, it's Chris. Great. It's Simon. Hello. Hey, Artie, how you doing? I'm good, buddy. How are you? I was I was so nervous about this interview because Great, I'm like, I'm thank like, you, man. I was I was so nervous about not being able to understand you. I'm like, fuck, man. I remember that tour. I was like, it was so hard. <laughs> I will keep it slow. I will keep it slow like 2003. <laughs> How have you been, though, man? Have you been all right? Yeah, man. Yeah. I was in the basement of one of my bars um, and uh, just, you know, living through the pandemic. How, how are seen... things in a. Uh... Yeah. I didn't know you owned the St. Vitus bar. No one told you? The fucking best, <laughs> best metal bar in New York, man. What the fuck? I've been trying to get you to fucking play for years. Motherfucker. <laughs> Listen, I'll be there, man. I, I've been watching, been watching like the uh, Imperial Triumphant, who are one of my favorite bands. They played your venue a couple of years ago, and I've been watching that nonstop because they played one of my favorite songs, Chernobyl Blues, and I can't believe yeah. they played it live, and it's just insane. Oh, but hats I, off I, to you, Artie. Hats off to you, brother. It's so funny. It's so funny that, that you like Imperial Triumphant because that's like right, like you guys, you guys were always into like this really angular weird american indie rock like i remember i remember when we toured with you you listened to the fucking champs i think pretty much non-stop yeah, the man. entire time you <laughs> had like a little little boom box you guys would bring backstage and just fucking listen to that shit all the time it's so funny that's right uh, that was when we used to have to carry like 160 cds you know before mp3s <laughs> or anything and everyone would bring these massive folders of fucking albums it was so yeah. weird <laughs> Yeah, four hundred. The four hundred holder in the in the van. So yeah, exactly. <laughs> all of all of them scratched and unusable by the end of the tour. <laughs> so uh, to give a little history, I used to be in a band called Instruction, um, and uh, we were only popular in England, and uh, and and a little bit in Scotland um, for like twenty five minutes. And uh, I was lucky enough to um, do a tour. I did a series of tours with bands like Hundred Reasons and Hell's for Heroes and funeral for a friend and of course famously biffy and uh this tour it was just before the vertigo bliss came out it was in the questions and answers um video had just aired on mtv uh, i want to tell a story from that tour to start this off because it was i had a, a, a totally life-affirming experience when i was on that tour and it was at the zodiac in oxford and you guys were doing this Steve was your tour manager, the guy, with... right? Steve, was that his name? Yes, yes, he was. Yes, okay. <laughs> so I remember Steve, like every day you guys would jam for like two hours before sound check. And we used to be like, oh, it's so annoying. Like, God, these guys just be fucking quiet, man. What the fuck? Because we had been on tour for quite a while. And I think this was your first tour to support Vertigo. And one day at, at the Zodiac, I'm standing there and I'm like, I'm listening to you guys play, and I'm like, this is fucking great. Hey. 
phenomenal. Like totally, you guys were totally writing songs for Infinity Land at, at that point. And your that record and Vertigo hadn't even come out. Yeah. And just to watch you got just to watch the way your kind of your guys' brains work together was one of the most life changing things. And every day I watched you guys do that from then on. And it was like it just it really changed my perspective on writing music and and the connection between you guys, which was so obvious even back then. And you got I mean at that point you guys have been playing together for what, seven years or something? Yeah, I mean, this was like our very first band. So, yeah, we'd been playing together from when we were 15. So I think, yeah, we were probably 22, 23. So the same age yeah. as, as, I think we were all roughly the same age. Um, but, but, I mean, you you were back to the UK a lot with uh, with your crazy gave John, hardcore gave Johnny band. Gay for Johnny yeah. Depp. And, and were you not in, you were in, it's not Error Zone, forgive me. You, you also uh, played... You came to the UK loads. I remember seeing you loads over the years. Yeah, uh, Air Type Eleven was the band. It, for, uh, yeah, of course, man. Yeah, uh, unbelievable. We, we, we were we were, like, we were label mates with Marmaduke uh, on Captains of Industry. Captains of Industry. That's right. That was the most bizarre and eclectic label. <laughs> I was always desperate to see you live, though, because I remember reading reviews of the shows, and I think my mental mentality when we were doing. The Duke and Johnny Depp were similar, you know. It was like oh, yeah. anything goes, anything goes. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's funny. I, 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 whenever I hear Gay for Johnny Depp now, I'm just like, I don't know if that would go over well in this day and age. You know, like it's just everything about it. You, you could be right. Uh, I, I know, know it's like it, I know maybe just the pure fun aspect of it might not might frown upon at the moment. You know, <laughs> <laughs> well, also, great Johnny records in my taken... great records. Uh, thanks, man. Cheers. Well, let's get to you. Um, uh, so the last time I saw you play live was at Irving Plaza, actually. Um, and that show was amazing. And it's it's really interesting because when we came back from the tour we did with you in 2003, we couldn't stop screaming about you as a band. Uh, it was like, I mean, I remember going, talking to the people at Banquet in America and going like, you guys got to put this fucking record out, Black and Sky and Vertigo, which Black and Sky to me is the best emo record ever written like in all honesty oh it's, like, it's just so it's so fucking good and I, it's been such an honor to watch you guys just get better and better weirder and better and then even weirder and then more pop and then it's a uh, it's you guys are an anomaly that i don't think could exist in this day and age if you started now and how do you feel about that like yeah. the, the progression and whatnot I think you're right. There's a there was kind of an innocence and a naivety to what we were doing, which which I'm glad. When I look back, I'm really glad it was undiluted by any kind of like you know career ambition. It was all musical ambition, and I think you're right. We we always asked quite a lot of our fans. You know you know our songs in the first three records were really quite complex, and we'd maybe hide the the kind of pretty pop chorus like four minutes into a five minute song. And, but actually, as time goes on, I, I realise that actually, I think we've always had these pop moments and these really extreme kind of more chaotic yeah. and aggressive moments. But, but perhaps they were all kind of ensconced in like one song previously. And now I think, I think I'm a bit more relaxed when I write songs that I can, I, I'm happy to let a song be a pop song. And I'm happy to let a song be like a, a hardcore song or, or vice versa. And, but it, it's what keeps me coming back, Artie. And I know you're, uh, you know, I know you're still playing and everything. It's, it's either in you or it's not. And yeah. that need to kind of express yourself and, and kind of change how you express yourself. Because I don't want to be expressing myself musically the same way I did when I was 21. You know, that, that wouldn't yeah. be true to who I am. So, so you know, things are going to change. The, the things I love and the things I'm going to, uh, to be is all always going to change but but it's 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 the core of Biffy that kind of oddity of where we don't really belong anywhere we kind of we're too heavy for yeah. pop fans we're too pop for metal fans we're too we're too angular for indie rock fans you know but I quite like it because the people that get it and the people that know what our band does they really understand it and that's what means the world to me and it, I, I can't thank you enough for your kind words there brother because that, that was such an important and educational time for us as well. You know, watching you guys, that era of, of bands and 
you guys were kind of almost adopted Brits at that point because you spent so much time. And as you say, you toured with so many amazing bands, but it was such a fertile period and everyone was doing it for the right reasons. I think that's what was so pure. It's like we all wanted to actually kind of inspire each other. We wanted to spur everyone else on to make something even better. And um, so I feel, I feel like honored to kind of have come of age during that time period. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it, it was a, and, and you're totally right. It was a, it was a tight scene. Like everybody was really like supporting each other. I mean, I, I must've, I always would sing on stage with Hells for Heroes or hundred reasons. And like, you know, it, it was, everybody was, everybody was listening to each other and watching each other and really getting, and we were all playing the same fucking shitty toilet circuit, which was, you know, and literally a <laughs> toilet in, you know, what, what's that fucking place? I forget where it is. Tunbridge <laughs> Wales. Know, Cambridge Wales. <laughs> literally a toilet. Tunbridge um, Wales, yeah. Uh, it, but it, it's, a, uh, it was, it's amazing. I, I feel honored that I got to see you at that time. And, and in all honesty, I saw you, um, I saw your, I think it was your first show in America uh, at the Highline Ballroom with Enter Shikari opening. And it was one of these, you guys had just signed a yeah, road man. And, and I remember the show so well because right. Enter Shikari had about 400 people going nuts. And then they got off stage and then you guys played to about 70 people. And you were awesome. <laughs> yeah. I, I remember that show actually like it was yeah and, and to shikari was and, 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 and then they play a fucking sick of it all song and you'd be like what yeah. the fuck is going on here and i couldn't understand why kids were so into it but you know what what do i know they're huge but but fucking you know like exactly you on, exactly it's it's not for me to like i'm too old but the, the uh it's it's <laughs> it's amazing with you like you guys came out, you fucking killed it. You were, you know, your typical great fun Scottish mood. And, <laughs> but um, I also saw you, um, I was trying to think, you guys did a, like a weird underplay at Bowery Electric. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, that's downstairs, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. It was tiny. That's one of the smallest venues we've ever played. I think you can touch the ceiling, you know, like, like you know, yeah. with your nose, with your nose. <laughs> But that was, that was actually a killer show. There was, there was something I remember in that period, you know, things had started to kind of grow for us in the rest of the world. And I remember turning up to the state, you know, in the States to start that tour and playing Bowery downstairs and thinking there's maybe like, I don't even think it fits a hundred people, but, yeah. but everyone in there was absolutely a part of it. You know, that way it was like everyone was sweating, singing, breathing together. It's just that yeah. it was, it's one of those gigs that gives you, that makes you fall in love with, with live music again, you know, cause it's, it's the variation. I like, I like doing, having the option, you know, to do bigger shows and smaller shows. Cause they each give you something different, you know, some help your ego, some help your playing as a band, but, but the small shows really kind of go straight to your heart because you, because you're really, it's that intimacy. I think, you know, Artie, it's, it's important and hard oh, to no, replicate so sometimes. Absolutely, and and uh, you know I think you guys do it really well. It, it's a uh, you guys did a you guys did a really small club tour across America, right? Like you guys are playing super small places. Not, yeah, long, not that long ago. We've actually done a yeah, we've done a few kind of smaller tours around the states. And the the thing is, it is I mean, as everyone knows, it's fucking massive. You know, <laughs> you definitely know. But like, you know, you're driving for days and sometimes, you know, you stop, you stop in Salt Lake City, which is obviously quite a, a common place to stop. And you're maybe not sure, you know, places you've never been to up in Omaha. And we played Chattanooga. We played um, like Louisville. You know, it's like these places that you're like, what the fuck are we doing here? But you know what? I've always, I've always said I'd rather be like a hundred people's favorite band than a million people's 10th favorite bands, you know, I would much rather share our music with people who really care and who, and who want to be part of it and, you know, that, than just kind of be, oh, they're quite a good band. You know, I want to change people's life micro level. That's never left me, Artie. I want to change your life tonight, brother. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Hegelmania. Yeah, the, the, uh, what's, what's awesome, I saw you, I saw you guys, uh, I, I was at the record release show for Puzzle at, Bright, at Brixton Academy. And uh, I happened to be in town for oh, tour, wow. and that and uh, yeah, it was it, Neil got me on the list. So I mean, love you, Neil. Hope you're watching. 
Um, <laughs> the fucking the uh, it was uh, it was one of these ex like incredible experiences because the first time the time I'd seen you before that was was literally fucking you know uh, I, I guess I want to go back and tell a little bit of a story about the tour we did together. So the tour we did together. We, we broke down, the first show was in Edinburgh, we broke down and couldn't make it. And uh, so then I remember like we played, I think it was Liverpool was next or something, but there were no more than 50 people at every one of those shows. Like it was fucking crazy. And there's probably a few people who are on here now who saw it. Let us know if you saw any of those shows because they were fucking awesome. I only had one guitar left that worked. That's how fucking poor I was. But I remember- That's the right. <laughs> Is we play against me, it's such a piece of shit. So fucking, I remember <laughs> we got to London and it was like all of a sudden it's, which, you know, is the typical experience when you're that size in England and in the UK is when you get to London, everybody shows up. So it's like every person that was at every yes. fucking show shows up in London. <laughs> and it was the first time I ever heard anybody go, do, 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 do. <laughs> and I was like, no one did it on the whole fucking tour, but in London, it was louder than everything. And I was like, yes, finally. Like, yeah, you, know, honestly, cool. you wrote that part for that. You wrote that part for that, right? <laughs> if only was, I was that clever. If only I was that smart. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta let people know when to sing along. But yeah, I mean, like, you can see my excitement from that time. It was like, oh man, I, I just, I was so like, I was dripping with pride almost, which is a weird thing to say, but it was like, yes, yes. There's a bunch of people here who fucking see what I'm oh, seeing. I get it. And you know, I want to, I want to throw like a huge, you get it. like shout out to all the fans of Biffy because what's interesting about you guys is here in America, nobody really like they hear Biffy Clyro. They're like, oh, okay, cool. This is like this sort of angular Foo Fighter style. They have to put it in a category. And you guys did so much mm -hmm. shit before you got signed to a major label that nobody in America knows about. So you don't, you don't get that, well, a few, a few, the smart people do, but like you guys don't get the cred that you have overseas. You have a fucking shit ton of cred. I, I want, one thing I wanted to ask you about was, and I was always interested, I haven't seen you since, I haven't seen you since you signed to a major label. I've seen your A&R guy many times, drunk. But, uh, <laughs> but um, <laughs> a, bit. <laughs> a bit, not anymore, I don't think. But. Uh, I, uh, did you get, did you feel any backlash when Puzzle came out? Did you, because I mean, the, the difference between Infinity Land and Puzzle, when you already kind of talked about it a little bit, where you, you, you guys could have, you wrote like 17 fucking riffs in one song that all could be singular hit songs mm. and put them all in one. But with Puzzle, you slowed it down. You made, I mean, there was still weirdness. Did you guys feel any, any major backlash from like the, the real Mon the Biff fucking fans? I guess there, there was a little bit around Puzzle, but I think because we hadn't necessarily, like the album hadn't necessarily been like a success at that point. So I think there was still a lot of that really goodwill, like there are boys. I think inevitably when any band makes a step up into like the mainstream, then there's, then you annoy some people. And, and I'm one of those fans with other bands, you know, that I'll be like, oh, I fucking love their first few records and now they're, they're this or that. But what I appreciate is the fact that the people that still connect with those records and maybe don't necessarily like what we're doing now, I know that they have a proper, honest, truthful connection to those records because they were hard, they're quite intense to listen to. We weren't a band that was easy, so you needed to kind of seek us out and I think so I'm so proud of those records for what they are but they are very much like their own kind of it almost feel like we were a different band then that that three album like mm -hmm. three yeah. albums in three years and it was just we were learning everything I was learning how to write songs but you know yeah there, there's I guess there's always a bit of backlash e even coming each album you get someone from the previous album saying, you know this is rotten compared to the last one and, and that's fine you know, I think that's just the nature of doing this for so long. But I have to say, I'm extremely proud of, of every record we've done. And I, I can hand in heart say that every record, we couldn't have made a better album in, at that moment in time. And, and it's because I know, you know, as the songwriter of the band, I know what I put myself through and the pressure and, this, and, and, and what it takes to make a record. And you can't half arse it. You know, you, you know better than anyone, Arty, you can't make a record and, and not fully commit to it. And, and for me, 
it's it's about reflection of who I am at, at whatever moment of my life. So I'm so proud yeah. of those records, but I, I couldn't even make those records again if I tried. And, and, <laughs> and some of the fans that, that love those albums are like, why don't you make another Vertigo of Bliss? And it's like, my mind was in a particular place at that point. You know, like, I'd maybe just was just discovering like the under proper underground music. I was maybe rediscovering my love of, of pop music and, and things. It was just that kind of classic chemi chemistry came together. Um, but make no mistake, it's like every time you write a song, you're coming from your perspective at that moment. But um, backlash is good. It means you're doing something right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I, I've always, I've always felt that way. A a any re the, the, the reason you get into a lot of this stuff is to get a reaction and to do weird shit is to like sort of surprise people. And I mean, I grew up, like, prog rock is my favorite thing in the whole world. And so like when I heard you guys doing your version of prog rock, which it really is at the end of the day, when you listen to some of the longer form songs on Vertigo and uh, Infinity Land, especially, which is a fucking shit show. I mean, that fucking record is like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I remember you guys smoking a lot of weed, a lot of weed. <laughs> yeah, I was like, I remember hearing Infinity Land. I was like, they didn't smoke that much weed. Like, did somebody get introduced to DMT or something? Like, what the fuck? <laughs> it, it's funny. I could always say to people, see if we didn't smoke weed, we'd be fucking dangerous, man. We'd be so <laughs> dangerous if we didn't smoke weed. <laughs> that's as we're like this. We're half asleep most of the time, and it's still like zap, zap. <laughs> you guys, I remember you guys had a fucking hookah that you brought with you all, everywhere. It was like. The, <laughs> It yes, like, you're exposing us them? for what we wear then, which was, yeah, that's before, even before the gig, before the show, it was like, let's get the vodka and the ball out. We're, <laughs> I don't know how we survived, to be quite honest, but what a great time, man. I, 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 don't, I can't I, do that anymore, that's for sure. I think you might have convinced me at one point to take a sip of that vodka. I, I remember there was, a, there was something I did, <laughs> and we were talking about doing beer bombs. And you were like, oh, mate, it's vodka in there. And I'm like, what? I'm like, oh, shit. Oh. You know, it's fucking gross. <laughs> Beer bombs are actually a thing. Uh, anyway, but, uh, I, <laughs> yeah, sorry, I, I digress. It's fucking. That's all right. I love a beer bong, man. A beer bong is good. It's hard work. Hard work. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, so uh, you have a new album out, um, which obviously has gotten a, a bit fucked up by the whole pandemic thing. Uh, celebration of endings which is an awesome name um and uh what let's talk about it a little bit there's you're talking about going off the leash there's one song on the record i don't know the name of it where it's just like full-on old school biffy fucking screamer and then there's like this beautiful string out part in the middle of it it's like totally fucking schizophrenic but uh talk about the record a little bit i'm guessing you recorded it last year yeah yeah, it was, um, we recorded it in 2019, which now feels like a fucking lifetime ago for all of us. Um, yeah, and it, the, the record, it was, it was about, there was a, a period in our um, last couple of years where foundation, our foundations were shifting a little. We had a couple of relationships professionally that came to an end and, and our whole foundation shifted. And it wasn't necessarily like a, a desirable thing for us. We didn't necessarily want these relationships, but they did. And I felt like I had to kind of take a reset of just why I was playing music, writing songs, whether whether I'd lost the balance of um, writing for myself and my friends or whether it was career and things. So so it, it, I took a few months just to kind of decompress and then all these songs started falling out. And um, as, as I'm sure you know, the world is such a fucked up place at the moment. Over here, we're dealing with like Brexit, with with just like the worst government we've ever fucking had, um, and and there was, and it's like people were clearly lying, admitting that they're they weren't telling the truth, that they're scared of the truth. So there was a few things in in life in about 2017 and 18 that I just thought I can't handle this. I need to kind of reset for myself. So it was that's where the title of celebration of endings coming from. It's like trying to make the best of a bad situation. You know, you, you don't yeah. ask to be in a certain position, but then you're in it and then can kind of embrace the opportunities on the other side. And thank goodness, you know, I've been saying thank goodness it wasn't like a, a summertime reggae record I was fucking writing last year, because that would not have gone down well in twenty twenty. <laughs> but but these songs very much felt like they felt like they they fitted with this year, and I think I think if they hadn't, maybe we would have postponed the album. But it felt like the songs were really saying 
in a personal level, we're seeing kind of what we were all going through at the moment. And I don't want to, you know, everyone, oh, I wrote this song and now it, it, it obviously just it talks about this moment, but genuinely it's, it's that sense of having no control and about that sense of trying to make do, you know, as I say, making the best out of a bad situation, trying to make yourself grow from change and grow from, from this. And I, I think the, at the moment, what we're all going through in the world, Artie, I think, I think we are all adapting and we're all learning new skills. We're learning new ways to... And I do think that... I hope that something positive comes out of this. I know there's going to be a lot of kind of negativity for a little while. You know, you guys get the election coming up, which gets more and more fucked up by the day, you know. <laughs> and so, so every, everyone's going through this traumatic kind of unsettling few years. And actually, I think this is maybe what we need. I think we need a reset. I wish it didn't take something like this because because I feel, you know, anyone that's struggling their health or lost someone, I think it's awful. And I'm, I'm sorry to say that out loud. But sometimes it takes a traumatic event for us to rediscover what we need to achieve as, as, as people and as, as a society. So, um, yeah. so yeah, that's what the album was kind of in that, that semblance of, you know what, let's, let's get through this and make, and make things come together. Let's pull shit together. Well, let me uh, ask you about this. Like you were saying that you were, you were kind of resetting. Did you write Balance Not Symmetry like at the same time? Or was it, because that, that record, uh, but, wow. It's really good, man. It's super cool. I haven't seen the film, oh, th but, but the soundtrack is fucking great. Don't, really don't, don't watch the film. <laughs> don't watch the film. <laughs> no, that, that's unfair. That's unfair, actually. The director, Jamie Adams, is wonderful. He did a great job. It, it, it didn't end up quite what we wanted it to be, the movie. So, so the album's probably the best representation, but Jamie Adams, the director, a wonderful talent, but... We, we, we only got like 90% where we wanted to be with the movie. Right. But that, that record, th those songs actually had come out from the moment we released Ellipsis, the last studio record. These songs just kept building up. In a, and in my mind, I was wanting to do like a, a solo record and I was going to do like an electronic record and I was going to collaborate with a couple of producers to make some projects. And before I knew it, I had all these songs and they came together and kind of formed this kind of narrative about this person struggling to deal with loss. And again, trying to kind of come out of that darkness and find a way forward. So I think you're, you're absolutely right that a celebration of endings wouldn't have existed as it does without that Balance Not Symmetry record. And for anyone watching that hasn't listened to it, it's kind of, we really went as eclectic as we could possibly have gone. You know, yeah, it's the first absolutely. songs that we've recorded with, with all on keyboards, all electronic. Some of them sound like, there's a song that sounds like an 80s kind of fucking rock set song. There's one that sounds like a folk rock. It's like, there's waltzy kind of noise. There's there's just kind of punk hardcore. And it, it's kind of everything that we do is about, gave me, it liberated me and gave me permission to, to put all the songs that ended up becoming a celebration of endings. I didn't have the fear about something being too pop or too ballady or too extreme. I thought, fuck it, we can handle it. You know, going through so much at the moment, the least you can do is put it all out on the table. Well, did you, did you, uh, I'm guessing you obviously saw the movie before you wrote the songs, or at least had an, a, a basic idea of what it was going to be. Like, did, did you, like, how did, how did that whole no. connection work? No? That's weird. <laughs> no, it, it, it was actually, the, the concept from, we wanted, to do it the exact opposite way around so so i was speaking to jamie the director for for about a year and we we were going to make a record before they shot the film so so some strands of the story were pulled from from some of the songs some of the songs influenced certain scenes in the movie there, originally we were wanting to have some of the dialogue cross pollinate with the songs so that at moments you know, like the actual dialogue would be in the song, oh, not like a musical, but that kind of idea. Um, and that's, that's maybe where we bit off more when we could chew, because I think doing it that way around was really strange, you know, because we didn't tweak the album afterwards. Yeah. And I think if we were to do it again, we would definitely do the visuals and then come with the sonics, because the visuals chasing the audio was, was a lot tougher. That was quite tough to do. Yeah, totally. It's, I mean, well, it's you know. typical us, though, as well. 
<laughs> yeah, you got to do it backwards, right? Of course. That's the way it goes. I mean, you know, yeah, you, can only, you can only hope for like a, a Kenny Loggins footloose or something, you know, or like, but, <laughs> I'm trying to, Bear I'm trying Lynn, to see. take my breath away, man. Take, your breath take away. my breath away. Or uh, uh, no, no, Dirty Dancing. She's like the wind, Patrick Swayze. You know, she's, she's like, like the wind. wind. Yeah. Like God, perfect, bless God bless Swayze. God bless Swayze. Apparently he was a really good guy from what I hear. No, RIP. I've heard he was a total know? gent. Who knew? Who knew? <laughs> so another thing I want to talk to you about is, is uh, another thing about you guys being an anomaly in sort of this world. It's like you, because you started on an indie, which a lot of big bands uh, at this point did not. A lot of them, like a lot of the bands that have been together as long as you guys, say like Deftones or uh, the Foo Fighters or bands like that. Um, what's interesting to me is like you, you can almost it's palpable in the music industry i mean pre-pandemic now with pandemic it's like what the fuck but it, to have bands that could get to a level that are younger that can headline festivals that can kind of fill in for the metallicas and the guns and roses and these bands that are eventually mm -hmm. going to go away and you guys are that band i mean i saw you i think we played reading and leads together i remember you playing uh first on the main stage um I got to catch you at Reading, and I think Good Charlotte played right after you, and they got bottled off stage. But uh, the uh, <laughs> actually, they took it really well. Fair guys, fair guys. Yeah, <laughs> they are. But, um, lovely, lovely. But uh, yeah, I, 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 like, it's it's really interesting to me because you guys have like you're you're almost like a Queens of the Stone Age type band in the sort of fervent, huge cult status. You're a cult band. But yeah. you have this, but you can draw, but like a huge cult band, which is like such an anomaly. I, and Queens of the Stone Age, I would say, as an American band, is a good example of a comparison to you guys, even more than the Foo Fighters, because obviously the Foo Fighters are Gabe Grohl. So, you know. Yes. It, it, whatever. Kind of its own but, thing. Uh, kind of its own thing. Yeah. <laughs> a little bit. Yeah, a little bit. So, how do, I mean, what, what's your, uh, I mean, we had Nirvana play at, at fucking Vitus, man. So, you know, that was a, that was a, that I was know a thing. you did. <laughs> how did, how did fuck? How did you pull that one off? How this is not my interview. Off, <laughs> we got a Next phone call. Well, you're we coming yes. to the Buffy interview. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> we got a phone call and we said yes. That was pretty much it. And you know, those guys turned out to be the fucking coolest people ever. I mean, I know you've played with them a bunch of times at this point. You know, yeah. I'm sure you could speak to Dave Grohl being as cool as he comes off as being. Yeah, absolutely. I know that it, it, it's amazing that he's He's got such a talent to make you forget that he was fucking in Nirvana and he's a singer of the Foo Fighters and all that. It's, it's a great talent to make. He disarms you, which is wonderful. Yeah. But I mean, you would fucking Nirvana. You would Nirvana playing. Was it St. Saint, Saint Vincent? Was it John from... Yeah. Uh, yeah. It was uh, well, John from... Uh, John Deer Coughlin. Tick. Yeah, from Deer Tick. Deer Tick, uh, yeah. Which was, he, he was incredible. He was actually teaching those guys the songs. They would huddle in between every song to like try and get through it. And Chris Novoselic, Chris Novoselic had a, a pint glass full of Maker's Mark, I kid you not. And he was already wasted. The ceiling of our stage, he was like at the top of it. It was really funny, like he threw the, <laughs> I think he hit himself in the head with the fucking bass a couple times. But, <laughs> but uh, I mean, they were great. And that was their second show of the night. And, and uh, you know, it was like, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, they just Jay Maskis, the Hall of Jay Maskis, yeah, yeah, they had played the Hall of Fame show earlier, and uh, Lord was supposed to play with them, but she uh, she had to go to Australia, uh, so so Jay Maskis filled in, and Jay Ma watching Jay Maskis play That's with hilarious. fucking dude, it was amazing, amazing. Like I, I and there was only was about he... hundred people there. Right, of course. I, I've seen the footage, man. I watched the footage at the time. It, looked, it was the place in the universe. It was the place in, to be at that point. It was absolutely insane. But, but yeah, Jay Mack's guitar volume, he plays so fucking <laughs> loud, doesn't he? Dude. He had a fucking, he had like, like I'm two sure, high I'm sure fucking... a marsh, he used to... No, it was high watts. He had high watts, like fucking. Oh, high watts. But he used to have one just in front of his microphone. So, so if, if he had his microphone here, he would have an amplifier there, just firing into his fucking ear. <laughs> He's an absolute nut job. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I've, I've met him a couple of times and he like, you know, I, I don't know if he's just super weird, which he is, but, 
or he just couldn't hear me because he's fucking deaf. You know, it's just like I'm talking to him and he's just doing this. I, I I borrowed one of his guitars. <laughs> I borrowed one of his his. Uh, he had a twelve string, like a sixty four twelve string uh, Fender Jag mm -hmm. that I played on on an Aerotype record, and I spilled coffee on it. I I I, I was playing slide with a coffee cup, <laughs> and I told him that story. With and he coffee literally just goes, it, you <laughs> he, looks, he just looks at me and he goes. And he just walks away. He didn't say a word. I was like, <laughs> what's, what's happening? I know you. I, you don't I want to piss got, off Jay, man. You don't want to piss no, off No, man. Jay. No, no. He's a, he, he has like, he has like a fucking guru that follows him around. Like he's a fucking weirdest, weirdest fucking dude. Have you ever met him? Really? Yeah, yeah. He's got a guru. No, no, not face to face. Oh, uh, yeah. He's, yeah, he's out there, man. You should try. Yeah, if you, if you guys play a festival together or something, you should try it. Try and get on the J train because he's fucking weird as shit. <laughs> oh, I bet, man. What a player, though. What a guitar player. He's fucking unbelievable. Yeah, I mean, he's a complete inventor. I, 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 you know, between him and Kevin Shields, who they're very close friends, like those guys, like the things that those guys invented alone is, is fucking incredible. So, uh, speaking I of know. which, I, I want to ask you about like um, modern, like you guys are always huge music fans, like massive. Mm -hmm fans are always talking about bands in the press and, and when we toured with you to us like you know just screaming about jawbox or whatever you were listening to at the time the fucking champs um aerogram uh your code name is milo back then yeah. uh, like a lot of those bands are like i don't know what's up with scotland and weird names and bands that are have st fucked up fucking time signatures but there's <laughs> something about it um is there anything you're listening to now that you're like psyched on that's like kicking your ass um... Yeah, well, as I mentioned, the Imperial Triumphant's Vile Luxury record, so not, not the new one, Alphaville. I'm still getting my head around Vile Luxury. Um, so that's blown me away. What else? I, would need to, I need to check my phone. My memory these days, see when I go in and actually buy records, you know, I used to remember everything I bought. Now I'll just listen. So I listen to the new, yeah, yeah. new, the new John C. record, the new John C. from Sigur Ross. It was to his new record okay. last night. And that's a beautiful record. I mean, if you like his voice and everything, he's, he's such a he's such a medicine when you listen to him. But his work, the electronic work and everything on, the, on that new record is phenomenal. It's so beautiful. The, um, what else have you been listening to? The Fiona Apple record. I know she's not exactly new on the scene, but, but that new Fiona Apple record, Fetch the Bolt Cutters, really touched me. I thought it was such a raw, primal yes. kind of expression of of just just who she is and i think it's i think m more artists and bands and singers can learn from that it's like she didn't tweak what she was doing or cater what she was doing but she made a really vital piece of art in a, in a time when when it was hard to do so you know it's a real tough era for, for it you know anyone to make a piece of art like that so that yeah. uh, oh, absolutely, absolutely. I, I was listening, are you uh, listening to a band you... called mouthing mouthing okay i'll check oh, that out sorry bro Oh, yeah, amazing. Say, They're are, great. Are, Unbelievable. Are you feeling like I, I know? For me personally, during the pandemic, I've been, I've been having a lot of uh, a lot of trouble, sort of sitting down and concentrating or playing or feel, feeling any other. Like I'm also a business owner, which is completely fucked right now. But like you know, not, oh, man, obviously your know. record being delayed, you not being able to tour, you know, all these things that you're kind of used to doing. Do you do you feel relief from that? Or are you feeling inspired? Like, I, I personally, I find it really hard to write. Although I feel like I'm writing great shit. It's just not, I'm not writing as much. You know, it's like every once in a while. I also have a yes. kid, so it's hard. But, you know, it's, uh, are, oh, you, are you feeling inspired? No, oh, thanks, man. <laughs> um, no, no, I, I don't feel inspired. I, 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 I'm still picking up a guitar. I'm still coming up with a few songs and a few ideas. But, but at the start of this, I, I really thought every day would be a new fountain of, of joy and, and, and creativity. And actually, I think in, until, we, until we start to come out of this or start to see a bit of light from the other side, I think that's when people's juices will start to flow. I, th I think the, the art that's going to reflect just now won't actually be created until a year or so away. You know, I think, because we need to process it as people. So at the moment, I think we're all just in a level of shock because 
everything has kind of the value of everything has changed you know all all our, everything we had balanced before is kind of is kind of off kilter now and and i guess the act of writing music before just it felt a lot more innocent at the moment i think i feel the kind of pressure of of the moment and and there's so much talk about you know are your new songs going to going to reflect what we're going through and it's like i, I don't know i don't know you know so <laughs> so, so no the, the creativity isn't quite as uh, overflowing as i thought it would be but actually yeah. i'm i'm about to start working two other records arty i'm doing um, i'm working on a drone project called tippy toes which is just going to be all analog synths and, and guitars and maybe one tom tom and then I'm working on a on a hardcore kind of grindcore record called Empire State Bastard, and so th those two albums are almost finished. And and I think I, I can express myself. Are you la are you laughing at me? No, the fucking names are awesome, man. They're fucking awesome. <laughs> I can't wait to hear them. Uh, so so what 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 a I mean yeah. So like these, you're able to sort of create at home by yourself, uh, in an isolation type idea. And are, are you, are you inspired, like the drone stuff, like what are you listening to, Earth or Sono? Like where is that coming from? Yeah, it's, it's Sun, it's Ohm, it's even a lot of, there's, there's this amazing kind of genre on, uh, online, it's called Death Dream. And it's, and it's like this, there's this kind of drone music, but it's, it's miniature like loops. And it just, it's this overwhelmingly like cold and kind of music that keeps you at distance but then if you actually listen to it more and more you kind of fall into it but I, right. I want it to be a record that you have to immerse yourself so it's, it's called almost like um almost like a meditative record it's like a version of a new age meditation album except it's going to be really brutal you know what I mean it's going to be like it's going to ask quite a lot of the listener but uh, they were always my go-to when, when I first heard White 2 back in 2001 or whatever it was it just, it blew my mind. I couldn't believe it. I, I remember discovering Lightning Bolt at the same time as Sun. And I remember thinking, this is it. Rock music has maxed out. You know, you've got <laughs> Lightning Bolt who were doing the fastest, the fastest music that anyone could possibly play. And then you'd Sun playing the, the slowest music you could possibly play. But yeah, I, I'm also a big fan of like Paul Bearer. A lot of the more kind of Doom stuff as well, I think is really exciting. You know, so so it's kind of like there might be a bit more doom in there as well than I'm anticipating at the moment. I'm thinking it'll be all analog synths and keyboards, but I know once I get in there, I want to strap on a guitar and do something a bit more riffy. So so I'm not sure exactly where it's going to end up just yet. I mean, it's it's super interesting. Like uh, we we had Sun play Vitus, uh, which was, I mean, uh, ridiculous. <sighs> they they, they uh, dude. Like we the, had, to, we had, to, we had the place must have been shaking, man. Oh, uh, I mean, it, it fits two hundred people. It, we had to, we had to hire a U-Haul truck just for the cases for the amps to put a, a box truck because <laughs> I, I, someday I'll, I'll, you know what? Like we can, we can talk, we can talk in a little bit, and and I'll, I'll set. I have a time lapse of them setting up on stage that is fucking insane. But like, it, it's interesting that you talk about like bands I like Paul Bear. Um, uh, like who have played by they played their first New York show at Vitus and uh, you know it's uh, all that stuff is really fucking amazing interesting innovative shit like Sun is Sun is definitely a, an acquired taste I'll say um, mm -hmm. but I mean dr and Drone is something that's been done for years and years and years and years but it's uh, you know it's amazing how popular Sun is and how you know like their their shtick is like something that's it is you know it, it's huge it's crazy. And, it, it's, and, it's so it's, intense, man. And, but it's but funny you look at you also look at there's 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 a few bands out as well. There's like um a couple of bands like um there's a band called The Body who who, yeah, yeah, who are, are this incredible dude, kind dude. of dude. Okay, yeah. wait, wait, wait. Well, they, <laughs> so the body, I I had a dB meter. The body was playing at Vitus. They were at 130 dB. <laughs> I'm not fucking kidding. Fuck off. No and way, had, man. Yeah, and we had just That's jumbo the room. Dude, it was fucking That's insane. And there's two of them. <laughs> and, he, and when he sings, have you ever seen them live? No, no, I haven't. Uh, I'd love to. He sings like 40 feet from the fucking mic. And you can really? see it. Really? And it still comes. Oh, my God. Oh it's my nuts. God. Well, that's insane. I'd love to see them. Because they, they made a couple of great records with Full of Hell, the hardcore yeah, yeah. band as well couple of killer records and that but you're right sun 
but the body's probably it's a more intimidating proposition than sun but it's actually probably slightly easier to get to fall into I don't yeah. know if you agree with that or yeah yeah I do I mean and and the sun and uh, they also collaborate I mean sun collaborates as well the, the, the record sun did with Boris uh is fucking incredible yes uh, that, that's my okay. favorite sun record by far but like yeah the body's done a bunch of collaborations and and they do it live too so they'll have full of hell play with them which is fucking killer like what one thing oh, I, I love it. maybe I the body back. I tell you what the next tip the next time the body are in, tell them there's a band from Scotland, Biffy Clyro, let's do a fucking weird collaboration. Oh my band. God, dude. <laughs> Great. I would love that because it, it'd be so interesting to know if they know who you are and be like, yeah, fans in the world, but that's cool, guys. Whatever you guys say. <laughs> uh, and, and they probably do. They're, yeah. they're, pretty, they're awesome guys. <laughs> and and intimid intimidatingly large. Um, mm. oh, one, thing, one thing you just said about listening to Sun right. is, uh, is that when you were saying like, oh, rock music is done. That's exactly how I felt in 1989 when say like grindcore was like really happening and the first Godflesh record yeah. came out. And the first Godflesh record to me, when I listened to oh. that, I was like, okay, this is it. Like it can't get any heavier than this. Like these guys have created something that yeah, is just- Yeah, it can get more intense. Yeah, and, and of course it, it did. It did, it, it was interrupted by grunge and all the other things that happened, but it keeps getting heavier. It, it, you know? People find a way, it, and that's the thing, that's what annoys me a lot at the moment, you know, doing a lot of interviews to record and things. The amount of people that actually like contextualize rock music and all that, like where are we now? To, it's like, listen, rock music will always do its fucking thing. Like rock music and, and metal and everything was, they were kind of fringe music and, and most of the best music has always happened in the fringes. And you don't really necessarily want the spotlight on that stuff because that's when it then dilutes it and it becomes something else. But as you say, there's always a way, guitar music will always evolve. Heavy music will always evolve because as, as, a, as a species, we need, we need that level of, of kind of extremity and volume. And, and maybe during this time period when everything's so disrupted, you know, maybe the younger generation are maybe enjoying the more, you know, something a bit more kind of, soothing but you know what every generation is something different that turns them on and it's it's no surprise that like this generation's reacting to the previous one and, and etc but you know what the amount of people that are now picking up guitars again is so yeah. fucking exciting you know and, it, and it's it's this way it all you know bands might not spend a year in a, in a practice room the way they used to and they might be using their laptops more but people are picking up guitars and making fucking rock music in different ways now and I, and I find it really quite an encouraging you know whenever I get too down and think oh it, has it peaked out you always discover something new and you're like no it hasn't this fuck these folks mind it, it found a new way to twist it all and that's um you know I, I do find it quite an exciting time Artie actually yeah no I agree I agree I, I think it can be it's uh, you can you can definitely hear the the results of modern recording though where people can record I know for me personally, like as time constraints happened in our lives, so I, I play in a band called Primitive Weapons, which is my most recent band. And, you know, I would go to the guys with a finished song and then they would, you know, kind of put their bits on it. I never did that before. You know, it was always like, hey, I got a riff and you play. Yes. And it's like, you know, it's like now I come you, in and I'm you... like, could you, pl could you play? What's that? What, what, do you have a setup at home, Artie? Do you, do you like, what do you yeah, use yeah. when you're recording I, then? I use Logic, and I just like kind of program Fantastic. the drums Me as too. I need to, and and uh, it's it's so simple. And uh, Kyle, the you know you know how they have the names for the drummers. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Kyle's my boy. <laughs> He's my boy. He knows exactly what I'm thinking, <laughs> man. But uh, it's it's interesting. And just yeah, like exactly. The, Tele telepathic. Yeah, totally. Like, it's you know it's like as you know, I'm almost 50 years old. And it's like, as you get older and life is different, it's, you know, you write a song and you like, you go and you, you demo it out by yourself. It used to be, you go in the practice space, then you demo it out. Then you go on to do, you get the yeah. producer together and do all that shit. So it's, it's, uh, it's interesting. It's made my songwriting a lot simpler. Like I've kind of fallen into yes. the uh, A, B, C, D, you know, that sort of pop structure, but it's also yeah, that, made yeah. it, it's also made it so that I'm, arranging more so it's like i you know 
over the past 20 years, like I, I don't just hear a guitar part. I hear a vocal part. I hear a bass part. I hear a drum part. I hear the whole thing. And, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, I've become a little bit uncompromising about it. I, I don't know how you feel, but obviously Ben and James yeah, are, are incredible players. And I, I would imagine that when you go to them, they're like, nah, dude, I'm going to play this. Fuck you, you know? <laughs> Sometimes they definitely say that to me. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm like you, Artie. I, I kind of hear the full, I hear the full thing. And for, for the first 10 years of this band, I mind, I'm sure you would have I remember having like 24 songs stuck in my mind that we didn't record yet at one point. And I remember thinking I was going to have a fucking, I thought my brain was going to melt because I couldn't, like there was no way to record these ideas. Now I find it so liberating, as you say, to be able to put something down and you're getting that rhythmic pulse that sometimes you forget, you know, if you don't, yeah. if you're not able to always record at that moment, you're like, oh, I had something brilliant. What was it? And so I really quite enjoy having that specific, you know, of where the song is going. But um, for us, you know, we still do, we still try and play the songs out in the practice room. We specifically didn't do that on our last record, Ellipsis. Um, I kind of wanted to change how we worked. And I think I love the songs in that record, but it, it does lack that little bit of band dynamic, which we brought right. back in you know, in this record. And I think, I think Biffy, that's an essence of what we do as a band, but I love being able to complete the song and complete a picture without having to spend a month learning it, teaching it to someone, and then trying to kind of feel it out and make it sound natural. There is something so liberating. And that's why, why would anyone ever spend like 18 months trying to figure out how to play a drum beat or something? If you can go on your laptop and go right there as it sounds brilliant, you know, so right. it has eased up the creativity is is more straightforward now, and that's tweaked it. But I think that again, I think that's exciting. We still work in a slightly more old fashioned way, just because we've been doing this for. So but when I'm writing, it doesn't always come through like that. We kind of go through that filter now afterwards, so that because I realise that that energy brings something to how I even deliver the song, even with my lyrics. I find I sing at a different register. If I'm standing in the room with the boys, I'll be like, right, okay, I'm singing up here and I can reach that. Whereas if I'm by myself, I better not try. So, so as you say, sometimes you become a little more rigid on your, you know, if you're in your computer, because you're like, yeah. you will be like, yeah, all right, there's there's code is bridge. It's also a sterile environment. So like when, when you know, the, the, you, you've obviously, you've been playing with these guys since 1995. And, you know, you, you've done other things to sort of like, you know, make your mind feel at ease that you can play with other people, you can do other shit. But, you know, it's like the bottom line is there's a chemistry there that has made you, you know, oh, yeah. for all intents and purposes, a famous rock star. And, you know, like a very cool one. But, you know, it's like, it's, uh, it's interesting to, to, to sort of have that balance. though. like nowadays, because, you know, what, what, when, when did you get your setup? Probably like, 10 years ago, five years ago. You know, it's like before that, yeah, it was just you were recording on a fucking tape recorder. Exactly, man. Uh, fucking right. It was in, before we used to use like a mini disc when we started, you know, oh, yeah, and yeah. you would spend, so you could spend skip like through an it. hour moving it, yeah, moving around the room <laughs> to even find out where you could set it so that you could hear everything. Because inevitably yeah. you sat it next to the bass guitar and it's just, <laughs> <laughs> you know, if, if, if it's next to the vocal or you sound like a fuck bat and, it, you know, so, or don't put it next to the hi hat. That's what we learned very quickly. Do not put or the your crash yeah. near the fucking hi hat. <laughs> far away as fucking possible, man. Yeah, it's, far it's, away as possible. Far away as fucking possible. Fucking drummers. Fuck drummers. Uh, <laughs> fucking Ben. Fuck you, dude. <laughs> um, it's, yeah, it's 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 just it's interesting to like, especially now with you guys being as big as you are. You know, it's it's uh, it, it's it's awesome to see that you're still able to and willing to take chances and it, you know uh there's a song called space on your new record which for any of the americans there uh please listen and watch the video i want to talk about this for a second because <laughs> you fucking how how much did you have to practice to get the uh the whole dancing thing down two full days two full days uh, we were in I knew, I knew I didn't want this video. It didn't feel like that kind of song. And I just, I was watching a bunch of, 
like it's, this is total lockdown shit. I was watching a bunch of modern dance online and a total YouTube, like total fucking down a YouTube hole. And it just, <laughs> I just thought, like it, it kind of dawned on me that it, it was probably the best way to kind of express this, the sincerity of that song without being too, without emoting to the camera. It was like, this is a sincere love song, but I don't want to be singing to you going, oh, you know, so I, I came up with the concept and then they, and then it dawned on me, I'm going to have to learn to dance. <laughs> so it was a, an absolutely terrifying 48 hours of, is this the worst thing that I've ever done in my life? Have I, have I actually jumped the shark right here? <laughs> but it was, it was so liberating. See, see to learn, see to like learn the song through a different medium. It was amazing. And, and I, I really, I really fucking loved doing it, Artie, but it was a, uh, the, the hardest part was the underwater section. So uh, I had to, we had to spend like five hours un, underwater and it was all that, you know, getting the, getting the fucking breathing thing passed to you. So they just disappear and they just leave you like five meters down. And then the, if you wave your hand, they come in and, and give you the breath. But that was, there was moments in that where I thought I was going to die. You know, I thought this, you know, the pressure in my head was just like that, it was awful. But again, it was so worth it because the video has ended up being one of my kind of, one of my favorite oh. kind of pieces of art as a video. Some videos are kind of docu documentation. This felt like it was hand in hand. So I'm really, I'm really proud of it. So, so thank you for not laughing too hard at my fucking dancing. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just, I just thought about you having to go through all that shit. I was like, oh my God, he's gotta be fucking miserable doing this. But it, it's, it's, you uh, know what it's it a takes. great video. You know what it takes. Oh yeah, no, it sucks. I, I hate, I, I, I don't hate making videos because at least like, you know, I know that there's somebody who's interested in seeing it, you know, something like that. You know, it's like, <laughs> it's like, I'm not, I'm not wasting my time here. It's cool. But, you know, it's weird miming to the camera. So I get what you're saying. And what is beautiful about it is that the song is a piece of art and the video is a piece of art to go along with it. It's not just some bullshit thing that you, you know, like put together because you had to be on MTV or whatever. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a real piece of art and you guys are real artists. You're not Thank you, fucking, you know, some pop dickheads, you know? So it's, 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 it's interesting, Thank you, so and, you know, much. yeah, dude, I mean, it's, I think anybody who's a fan of your band knows that and realizes that. And that's why you guys are allowed to get away with anything you want. You've built your career in such a fucking incredible way, man. Like it's, it's uh, again, it's an anomaly. It's something that it happens in metal world. It happens in, you know, like on a smaller level, it happens in various, like, you know, you got a band like Mashuga who could do whatever the fuck they wanted and be artsy and weird. Yeah. It happened in prog world in the seventies, but you know, in modern sort of rock, era where there aren't a lot of rock bands left you know at least in the charts it's no, all no. i know it's all hip-hop well I, I, again i just feel and... i feel so grateful it, it's it's people that you're yourself are to people that can, can, can are one interest in music and understand that that actually doing doing something different all the time is actually you know same thing all the time you know that's that's the simple thing to do. Making the same record over and over is simple. And I'm so again, I'm going to sound like a kind of sycophant to our own fans here, but I'm really lucky with our fans because they they get it. They know that we're going to sometimes have songs that maybe isn't right up their street, but they respect the artistic intent is pure. You know, whatever music we work on, we we're fully committed. It's it's what is fucking sincere and honest at that moment. And and you can you don't need to love all our records. But, but make sure to know that we fucking believe and, and we mean what we do. You know, there's never a piss take. You know, we, we don't take ourselves seriously, but we take our music fucking seriously, you know. And, uh, and I'm so grateful to the people that have joined us on this journey for so long. And it means the world yeah. to me, Artie, that you've been keeping your eye on what we're doing. It means, that oh, means a lot yeah, to dude. me, brother. You know, no, really I, get, I, get I get excited. And of course, you have, you know, my management in, in America, that, you know, Bill McGaffey and Indigo managed me for seven years. And so, like, you know, when I when they picked you up, I what a guy, yeah, oh, the best, yeah, the best. And, and oh, you know, like, to this man. day, like, he, he wrote to me the other day, I was listening to the instruction single. He's like, oh man, it's fucking, I can't stop listening to it again. I'm like, awesome, man, thank you. But it's, uh, you know, when they when they picked you up, and I talked to Bino all the time, oh, he's gonna and, get you know, it's like he, he hooked us up. You know, I was like, I was like, dude, I gotta get Simon on. Come on, for fuck's sake, this is like episode number two hundred or something. Like, come on. 
But uh, it, it's a, uh, you know, it's a testament <laughs> to, to how great you guys are. And you know, one, I just last question. And I've, again, I haven't seen you mm -hmm. since this happened. But the the whole like X Factor thing was such a fucking weird. Mm -hmm. Like for me personally, like when when I knew. <laughs> did you know that they were gonna do that? That dude was gonna do Many of Horror before he did it, or did you like wake up the we, next we got, day and be I like, I got like a, I got a letter saying that if if such and such they're they're gonna sing your song, you know, and and it basically it was kind of a yes no letter. Basically, if I wanted to, I could have said, look, you're not singing the song. At that point, it was so such a surreal letter that I was like, whatever, you know, I was, you know, I think we were in tour in Australia, actually, at that moment. So I was like, kind of whatever. And then, then it happened. And I'm like, holy shit. And then we, again, we obviously got a bit of backlash from people. Enough, but I, when I look back on it now, I, I'm, I'm really, I'm really quite proud of it because I've always said that I want the music and the songs that I write to be what stands around. You know, I want the songs to be the legacy kind of thing. And 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 when I look back, I'm like, that fucking was a, a big, so you know, that was a great fucking song, man. And and the most mainstream fucking TV show of the of the millennium came to our band. You know, our band, the most awkward. <laughs> a obstinate, like least likely band, and I just thought there was something poetic about it. I really thought there was something poetic about the mainstream coming to us, and that's what I always say. That you know, if ever I thought about where the band would be, I always said, "Well, we're not going to, we're not going to compromise to get to the mainstream. We're going to make them come to us." And it felt that like that was kind of what happened. And so, uh, yeah, it's still one of those weird things that I don't think about. And then, like when someone brings up, I'm like, "Fuck, that's right." <laughs> I'm like, how did that fucking happen? Well, what's, what, what's, so, what's so funny about that? It must have felt really good to be making money and not have to do the work for it. <laughs> <laughs> for the first time, it was quite nice. I did think, oh, I should maybe just write a few more really big hit singles and then life will be a lot easier. <laughs> totally, man. Just go for it. Fuck it. Let other, let other people fucking take the shit for it, you know? It's like, hey, and obviously you can do it. You know? <laughs> exactly. It's, inter it's, in it's interesting that... that 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 song coming out and being a big hit, of course, the TV show helps, but to hear yourself in a different context, it's a completely different context, the way that he did the song. And, yeah. you know, and it's, it's, it's so wild to me because I, I remember watching video of it on YouTube and then like switching to you guys doing it live and the whole fucking crowd is singing it and everybody's going nuts. And it's like, like, wow, it's, it's just like, it's so interesting that, you weren't involved in what they did as a, an arrangement for it. And it's just like, that must've been pretty cool to hear. You know, I was like, did you hate it or did you love it? it? Well, the, the key change freaked me out, man. I was like, don't put a fucking key change in my song, man. <laughs> but it, it did freak me out. But actually, this sounds I, I sound like, when I heard the, uh, Matt Cardo sing it, he, he had a really good voice. And I, I suddenly realized like, I'm at the top of my range. And he was in the middle of his range. Range. And I'm like, fucking hell, what am I doing wrong with the vocal? But... <laughs> <laughs> well, it was fucking awesome. But, it was know, really, it, really it, cool. It's great to hear. I'm sure you're just great to hear your song out of context. Though it is, when I hear anyone covering a Biffy song, it means the world. And I'm like, wow, you know, just it makes me, it makes my heart sing. Oh, that's, I mean, it should. Because, I mean, it's, like, they're not easy to play. So. <laughs> <laughs> they're totally, not they're not they're always deceptive very deceptive very i mean well anybody really gets into the the rhythm section it's like whoa like what the fuck's going on here it's like like and like the way that your guitar s slides in between everything is just like i mean it really is a bunch of kids who have been playing together for years and it's so rare to be able to hear that i mean like you know do, do you think you guys will play be together until your Rolling Stones age? Is that like? That's that's the plan. I mean, the as long as Ben and James want to play my songs, that that means the world to me. That's that's what it's all about. I know we're going to be friends. It's important as, as long as they are, they they're happy to play. Then I think that's what we'll always do. I can't see any reason that we would ever stop. You know, because we started so young, we're such an important part of each other's lives. The band is like is 
has just been in our lives for so long and, and they're, they're, we're all family even everyone we tour with now we've been in the roads for like over 10 years and as family it's kind of who we are and I have to say it's it's probably half of who I am as a person maybe even more you know like like, like my identity is in the band I know Ben and James feel the same there's just it would be very hard to ever let go of this and and I've always said that the music is 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 like almost I'm kind of writing it as much for myself that it's it reminds me what I'm going through as a human being and and it helps me kind of form milestones in my life and I don't see why, why I would ever want to stop doing that with Biffy you know there, there'll always be other projects that I'll be that we'll be interested in and we might take some time off here and there it's part of our beating heart you know I think in our in our DNA and it's oh, hell yeah. and, and actually during this lockdown, see not being able to play together, it, it's really been tough. It's been really, I know it, it's tough for everyone what we're all going through. This is the longest myself, Ben and James haven't played together in years, you know, so, so it's, it's really tough and I'm really missing them. And, and I think, I know that they're feeling the same way. So if anything, this year has made me realize how important this band is to, to me and, and hopefully to the boys as well. I don't want to speak for them. They're probably watching at home going, fuck off, mate, fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's thank you so much for doing this, man. I appreciate it. Um, enjoy the rest of That's your evening. You, um, it's great to fucking oh. see your face and, you know. Oh, I've missed you, Artie. I've missed you, uh, brother. i missed you, bud. Fuck yeah, man. And uh, well, just fucking, you what, let's... You're going to see... Regardless of whether we come and play for you one time, I'm going to come down and see you next time in New York. Oh, please do, man. Yeah, the, the door's always open for you, man. You know that. I'd I'd fucking come brother, and play. No, fuck you. You, guys, you, you assholes have to come and play. Fuck you. No way. <laughs> fucking right. We will. Yeah, make sure we do. Get Bambino told, and we'll come and I see you, man. We'll come and play. You know, it was funny. I, I interviewed Frank Turner uh, a couple, like, about a month ago or something. And I was like, I told him that I was well, on air. I was like, oh, I'm trying to get Simon on, but it's been really hard. He's like, oh, I'll fucking talk to him. But Frank has played St. Vitus, I don't know, six times or something. It's You're crazy. I swear to God. Wow. And th this is a really funny story. Which he, uh, he played his whole new album three months before it came out acoustically. And somebody filmed it and put it up on YouTube like the next day. I, and, I read it. I remember it, that at the time. And he fucking, he calls me and he's like, dude, you got to have it taken down. I was like, I have nothing to do with it, man. I, was, I, I knew who did it. So I like wrote to him. I was like, what you got to get it down. It, but it was like, I was like, I was like, uh, what I wrote back to him was, hey, dude, you need to text Charlie and, you know, Charlie Caplow. And I was like, text your label and just tell him 1995 called and there's no reason to fucking take it down. Like, what the fuck? You know, like, <laughs> like, give me a fucking break. Like 2020 is going, <laughs> hey, it'd be great if you've had this record up, you know, it fucking, oh, it was, you know, I know. <laughs> Classic Frank. Bigger they, fish. They, they, they want their, they want 1995 called. They want their business model back. But yeah, fucking uh, <laughs> it was awesome. And I, I'm glad after that conversation, you never heard from Frank, that fucker. I'm going to yell at him now. But thank you so much for doing this. No, he did, I hope, he did reach out. He did? Oh, uh, don't lie. Yeah, he, he did, man. Uh, that's classic Frank. No uh, lie, no such, lie. He's such a good guy. He's a jade. He's the best. Um, uh, but thank you so much for doing this. And, you, you know, like, watching you james and ben do what you've done and uh you know like it's it's all fucking love i mean they you know various members of Eratype have flown over to see you <laughs> play and instruction oh, Adam, adam's flown, adam's flown over numerous times but it's uh oh you know, like we, yeah yeah fucking well neil does we, we always oh, do you pass my, <laughs> pass my love we'll, I, I pass my love i will man i will and fucking, I love you guys. Say hi to Ben. The best and have a great night. Oh, Thank you so much. Love dude. you too, Artie. What a pleasure, my brother. Cheers, bro. Thanks for having me. You're a star. Right, have a good Thanks, one. everyone, for watching. Thank you.